You are listening to the Cycling Podcast, a de Tour de France in association with Rafa, the fastest closing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as a partner EF Education First and Canyon Charam. Stage 12, today we're in Bagnères de Bigorre. Just a quick story about what's going on around the Bar in Merida bus. Media scrums are part of the Tour de France, and this one is pretty funny. Like there's a mechanic coming out, uh, everybody's kind of uh, piling up, trying to get insight on what's happened uh, at the Bar in Merida with Ron Denis today. Everybody has its, his own idea on the story. There are rumors about Denis's bike not being uh, suitable for you know what he wanted to do today. Others mention internal problems within the team or health problems. We have no idea. But once again, you know, in the scrum, one of my favorite uh, journal journalistic exercises. I don't know. I know the same as you guys. I don't know. So I was behind the breakaway. I was focusing on the race uh, right. in front. So I don't know. Uh -huh. We are also confused. Let's say that I am disappointed about what happened uh, with Rowan today because uh, actually we expected big effort from him tomorrow. It was his decision today to stop on the fit zone. We tried to speak with him. We, we stop also with the car and try to find a solution what's going on. And he say, I don't want to talk and just abandon the race. Well, we we're played in there by a, a thoughtful Francois Tomizo outside the Barry and Merida team bus. Yeah, because it was fun because it was back. You know, we, we like to uh, be in a media scrum on the Tour de France, part of a part of the thing, and it, yeah, it, it reminds all these you know memories of, uh, well, you know, the doping scandals and uh, uh, and th there's always a story like that, a kind of a, a mystery or or a rumor spreading, and then, you know, and you see all of us like flies flying around the a old piece of meat or something, and that's us, you know, that's that's. And I find it funny. <laughs> the, yeah, and, and the, the man at the centre of it was nowhere to be seen, Rohan Dennis. We heard Tristan Hoffman, his sports director, who, as he said, was in the, the, the car following the breakaway today, so he didn't really know. Tris, uh, Rohan Dennis climbed off mid-stage um, one day ahead of the time trial. He's a world time trial champion. He would have been a favourite, if not the favourite for the stage in normal circumstances. He rode very well at the Tour of Switzerland just before the Tour de France. Um, he's been quiet here so far. And today climbed off, and it's it's shrouded in mystery, isn't it? It is all sorts of rumours, none of which have really been confirmed. Rumours of a of a heated discussion at the start on the Bahrain Merida team bus. Was that about team tactics today? Was it about um, the the preparations for tomorrow's time trial? We know that Rowan Dennis is a is a pretty fastidious guy. He's a very demanding, uh, or pr you could say probably a perfectionist. Um, can be fiery too. Can be a fiery fiery character yes and uh, well we heard also from the Bahrain Merida um, sports director Godad Stangeli who was kind of forced to be in the center of that media scrum I was actually very kind of in the right place at the right time because I was standing next to the wall exactly where a little croissant shaped bit of space had opened up and uh, Stangeli came into the middle and and he really didn't give much away um, about what had happened he, he denied that there'd been any kind of falling out he didn't deny that that dennis was unhappy with the the bike or the skin suit um which was one of the rumors but of course he's in a very difficult position there because merida is the co-sponsor of the team and teams very very rarely want to uh, place the blame for anything on the suppliers of the, the bikes or the kit we wondered whether Dennis had been ill. We know there's been a little bit of illness in the Bahrain Merida camp and, and Vincenzo Nibali has um, not been at 100%. We wondered whether, and this is where it gets kind of difficult for us, I think, we wondered whether th there's even a, a kind of a, a mental health aspect to, to this and whether, um, whether you know, he what Stangeli was asked whether um, that was uh, a factor. All we really know is that Dennis is out of the tour and abandoned in really strange circumstances. And there was something rumbling. Well, we will get on to talk about the stage in a moment, but um, and we'll return to this um, a bit later on. But Francois, you witnessed him this morning as well, yeah. acting strangely. Yeah, uh, yeah, because he, he came to the podium uh, and he, he talked to our colleague Sophie Smith, and l like like he was going to take part in the stage today and talk, take part in in the time trial tomorrow. He actually talked to her about 
you know, the, the, tomorrow's time trial. And then he came to the to the the, the rest of us uh, journalists at the, at the podium, the start podium, and he said. Uh, he, he told Sepp Piquet, he's a very good friend of Sepp Piquet, uh, it has to be said, and he, he, he told him something like, you know, count me out, which, uh, which sounded very strange, and, and Sepp told me straight away, I don't know, it's something odd about uh, what uh, Dennis uh, told me. So, so obviously there was already a crisis at that, at, that, at that stage, and we can from that probably think that, that it was, there was, the, you know, at the back of uh, Ron Dennis's mind, the, the idea that he might pull out was already there. And midway through the stage, uh, Dennis arrived back at the Bahrain Merida team bus in a team car. Well, came out of the bus with his agent, Andrew McQuaid, and they walked away into uh, the area by the podium and a away from the Tour de France. And so um, whatever the circumstances, it's sad for the race to lose the world time trial champion on the eve of the time trial in Poe tomorrow. But lots else happened today, um, Lionel and Clear. A very clinical win uh, at the finish in Banyard de Bigorre. Can you give us a tale of the etape? Well, I'd argue not a lot else happened today, really. But Some but stuff happened. Some stuff happened. Stage 12 from Toulouse to Banyard de Bigorre, 209.5 kilometres. One non-starter this morning, Jasper Philipson, the youngest rider in the race, UAE team Emirates sprinter slash lead-out man. Uh, youngest rider not in the race. Now the youngest <laughs> rider not in the race, yeah. The two non-finishes today were Rowan Dennis, as we've heard, and Giacomo Nizzolo of Dimension Data. And there was a huge 40-man break um, that contained a lot of big names. Too many to mention here. We're not going to do a, a blow by blow and read out the names of a quarter of the peloton. But Bora Hansgrohe and Sunweb had four riders. AG2R, Bahrain Merida, Lotto Sudal, EF Education First had three. And in all, 19 of the 22 teams had someone in the break. Um, and then when we reached the first of the two big climbs, a Perry Sword, Lillian Kalmajan of Total Direct Energy was away alone. And then before the final climb, La Horquette. Dunsey San, Simon Clark of EF Education First was alone at the front, but he was caught and passed by Matteo Trentin, and then a very strong looking trio of Simon Yates, also of Mitchelton Scott, of course, Pello Bilbao of Astana, and Gregor Muhlberger of Bora Hansgrohe surged to the front. They descended to the finish, and in the town, Yates went to the front just as they reached the final bend and unleashed a sort of track sprint to net Mitchelton Scott's second stage win of the tour almost 10 minutes behind Ineos and Luke Rowe in particular set a moderate but good pace on the two climbs and nothing much else happened because tomorrow we have the time trial in Poe and I think no one really wanted to uh, deaden their legs before that the fastest closing in a world tour the home of cycling with character ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as a partner EF Education First and Canyon Charam Thank you very much to our headline sponsor, Rafa. And it's almost time for Peddler de Charme once again. Uh, we awarded the week one Peddler de Charme t-shirt to Michael Morkov last week. We were sent a picture of him relaxing on the rest day in his Peddler de Charme t-shirt. Didn't spot that stain that we thought might have been on the front, Lionel, but um, that was fortunate. We've got, we've got unstained t-shirts <laughs> to give out to riders this week and next, um, and maybe an overall winner as well. Keep your nominations coming in. We've got Marcus Berghart, a strong contender at the moment. Uh, who else? Is there other, have been other contenders as well. Well, l listeners, keep the nominations coming. If you see anyone doing anything charming or hear of anything, any charming behaviour, uh, let, let us know by telling us on Twitter, at cycling underscore podcast. Or you can email us, contact at thecyclingpodcast.com. And we'll be giving one of the wonderful Rafa Peddler de Charme t-shirts. They are also available at rafa.cc. Well, we've moved away from the bar we were sitting outside because uh, the really quite noisy air conditioning unit just above us. It's quite a warm day. It's not the hottest day of the tour ever, is it? But the air con was on. Quite a cool day for most of the day. Yeah. Hmm. And I'll tell you who was cool today, Simon Yates hmm. in the finish. The three of them came in to Banyard de Bigorre. And, you know, it was a hard one to call because uh, Mulberger is second Tour de France, still quite a young rider. And um, we heard from him uh, the other day in our kilometre zero uh, on the rest day, well, about the rest day, he, he's you know a good good rider, great prospect, second in a stage of the Dauphiné to Julian Alaphilippe, and uh, rode very well today. But Simon Yates really showed all his canniness today. I think on the the climb when he was away with Mulberger, Peo Bilbao put in a big effort to bridge across to them, almost got on. He was like two two bike lengths behind them when Simon Yates attacked, 
and just made it a lot harder for him to get up there. So that was a that was good uh, in terms of a, a good tactical play by Yates. And then coming into the finish, I mean, everybody knew that there was this corner with 150 metres to go. Uh, Mulberger at the finish seemed to think that going around that in second would be the optimal position, but Yates was absolutely clear that he had to be first into that corner. He sat at the back. Um, you know, the other two just didn't seem to have the assurance that Yates had. And, you know, as well as being a good climber, a Grand Tour winner, he's a, he's a fast finisher as well. He's a former points race world champion. So it was set up perfectly for Yates and he, he was clinical in finishing it off. I mean, I don't think there was any doubt really that Simon Yates would be the stronger of the three there. I mean, Bilbao won two stages at the Giro, remember, earlier this year. So not to be underestimated, I didn't know an awful lot about Muhlberger's finishing in a situation like that, but but Simon Yates it just looked so calm and collected, didn't he? Letting the other two look at him, and he was just sitting at the back, um, biding his time and getting into that final corner first and, and finishing it off very well, completely taking the pressure off Adam Yates all mm. day as well. That's the, that's the other thing. We've had this debate in the car, and we've also asked, well, we heard a Dow Olympi talking about it in yesterday's outside the team bus having somebody up the road we always think well because we're comparing to team sky now team ineos and how they approach the tour with really only one objective which is to win the race overall we compare everybody to that uh, but actually uh, mitchelton scott by winning a stage the other day and then again today it gives adam yates a kind of free ride in the peloton the only question would be if he does need to call on support later in the race will these efforts add up will they compromise his chances but but at the moment we don't know that and with the tour de france you have to make hay while the sun is shining don't you i, I was talking to all the to pascal chanteur the other day who was involved in the you know in the riders trade union and who, who was also a rider in, in the day and and he was telling me you know the kind of old school cycling has died that that there's new strategies, new tactics, new approaches every year, and the, the, one of the new uh, tactics, which which has now become almost a tradition in the last five or six years, and and made actually Simon Yates' victory to the uh, highly predictable. Why do you take Simon Yates on the Tour de France? To, well, uh, you know, nominally to 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 help to help Adam Yates, and and we've seen him dropped every single day in the first week. I mean. It, it, it was, in a way, it was obvious that, that, that the plan was, you know, save as much energy as you can, help Adam in the mountains when, when, when need be, and w w when will it, the Adam need help? Probably in the Alps, that's when the highest altitude will be coming, and we know that both Yates brothers are pretty good in altitude. And, and in, the in the meantime, you know, lose as much time as possible, and if you have a chance, go for a stage win. So to, for, for me, when I knew Simon Yates well, this morning was in the break, and when you attacked in La Orquette dans 6 ans, the name of the winner you know, that, that didn't make any doubts. I, I, I was very confident that, 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 that this would be the winner. I mean, so in a way, uh, everybody knew that Simon Yes one day would, would, would go for a stage with or, you know, could, could have predicted that he would do it. But it, it's one thing to, to pr predict or forecast that, uh, you know, someone is going to do it. And, and, and it's another thing to do it. And the, the great thing about Mitchell and Scott, the, the, that tour so far, is that, you know, what, what, what they have planned to do, they've done. It. Simon Yates has completed the Grand Tour set today, just as Caleb Ewan did yesterday. Let's hear from a man that we don't often hear from because he's the driver of the second team car for Mitchelton Scott. Um, Matt White, of course, very familiar voice to our listeners. He kind of had a, a, a day off, really, because uh, what happens is when the brake goes up the road, the second team cars go to follow the brake, and the first team car stays with the team leader. So uh, Matt Wilson was in the team car behind, and, well, this is what he said at the finish. Difficult to uh, pull it off, but got goosebumps at the moment. The boys started the day, had a plan to try, we wanted to try and put uh, one of our bigger guys in with one of our climbers. It actually happened exactly like that. So. On the climb when uh, Bilbao was coming across to Yates and Muhlberger, just as he was about to get on, Yates just accelerated a little, a little bit, and we saw there that kind of cold-blooded, calculated racing ability that he's got. Both uh, Simon and Adam, you know, are both very calculative riders and quite cunning and. Uh, you know they've got a good track background and I think we saw that today also in the finish he knows very well what he can output he can uh, 
can put out and uh, you know, never went over the top. But managed his uh, workload all the way to the finish really well. The man who, whose company, Mitchelton, is in the team name, the man who has founded the team and, uh, well, owns the team and, well, bankrolled the team since it started, Jerry Ryan, arrived in France today and this was his reaction at the finish. Last year, Simon Yates won the Vuelta. It was the first Grand Tour victory for the team. How did that make you feel? To win a big stage and if you look at it, it's only five teams. Uh, <laughs> 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 Um, to, they're, like, they're like your boys, aren't they? Yeah, they are, and uh, to see that come home, and as, you know, as I said, in five years, I think there's only four teams that have won the, the, all this, the tours. But you know what? For him to come back today, uh, and I said to him, you deserve to uh, win today, and uh, and he's here riding for his brother, so uh, more to come. So I've just arrived today, so that's pretty special, uh, you know, one day in a stage wins. Disappointed I missed Daryl's, but I certainly watched it on TV. You've got racehorses as well, haven't you? Is there any similarity between the pedigree racehorses and the pedigree cyclists? Yes, there is, but uh, also you need a bit of luck with both and, uh, you know, a lot of hard work. And the harder you work, the luckier you get. Which is the most expensive, the riders or the horses? Ah, uh, the team is. <laughs> I mean, you've you, you bankrolled this team. It's been your project right from the start. And, you know, your, your company's name has, has been prominent throughout, really. Um, you know, do you, do you ever get a moment of thinking how much money you put into it? Or is it something that just gives you so much joy on days like today that it's all worth it? Well, there's, there's no pockets and shrouds, so uh, I can't take it with me. And... Uh, call it an investment because I look at the joy that brings people not only back home but uh, around the world I'm sure that uh, our fan base in uh, Great Britain will be uh, celebrating tonight. Well that was going to be my last question there's no no holding back when you've got a couple of poms leading the team. Uh, you know what we don't care where they come from as long as they're uh, a great team member and uh, can contribute and uh, you know they all do. Did they apologise for the Cricket World Cup result? Uh, we haven't got into cricket. I let them on, uh, focus on uh, focus on today, but I'm sure over dinner tonight, and I uh, I brought some Mitchells and a special Mitchell and wine out of my cellar, personal cellar, and I've got those to put on the table tonight. So it sounds like Jerry Ryan wants to have a little word about the cricket result with the <laughs> Yates brothers at some point, maybe over a very fine glass of wine from his own personal cellar. Chute, chute à l'arrière du peloton, cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. Well, that's Seb PK reminding us to tell you that tonight's episode and our Tour de France coverage is sponsored by Wattbike. Um, both of us, Lionel, took delivery of the Wattbike Atom um, in between the Giro and the Tour and, and used it a lot. Last night we heard about the pedalling effect in this score, which I was given, uh, or pedalling in effect in this score in my case. <laughs> and I spoke to Barney Wainwright, who actually developed this um, PES for what bike, and it's a fascinating bit of information that you get about your pedalling efficiency. Here's what he told me about it. The pedalling effectiveness score itself, you don't get the best score if you just pedal in a circle, as it were. If you, if you apply equal force all the way around the pedal stroke, so the score itself, the value you get, the way you optimise that is actually by putting the majority of the emphasis on kind of the downstroke and the pulling back stroke and a little bit of up pull on the back. And if you're doing that both on the left and right in a nice transitional sense as you move from one pedal stroke to the next, that's how you kind of maximise the score. We don't do any manip manipulation of the data itself. The data is just the force you apply. It's just how we're kind of rewarding you in terms of a score. So what we try and get people to do is have as, as a high number as possible but really trying to put a ceiling on 80 because once you get above 80 that's when you would be having to put a big emphasis on pulling up a lot in the pedal stroke or just as much up as you would be pushing down which obviously from a, from a physiological point of view and from a maximizing power perspective is not the best thing to do. Tomorrow night we'll hear more from Barney who will explain how you can improve your pedalling effectiveness score by using the Wattbike Atom and then translate that into gains when you're cycling out on the road. If you'd like to buy a Wattbike Atom you can go to www.wattbike.com slash tcp100 that's tcp100 and if you buy before the end of July you will also get £100 of Sigma Sport vouchers with every Wattbike Atom purchase so go to wattbike.com slash tcp100 and when you check out use the code tcp100 
Well, there was a bit of a truce today, predictably, really, with the time trial tomorrow in particular, and it was a stage with two pretty tough climbs, but not one that was necessarily going to force splits in the among the favourites. You know, why would any of them waste energy today with the time trial tomorrow? It's quite a long way from the final climb to the finish and also the time trial tomorrow, which is obviously very, very important. Our colleague David Walsh, as we were outside the press room after the stage, made quite a good point um, saying that the, the severity of the climbs is only important if they race them. And so today, yes, they've ridden the Perisord, which is tough. They've ridden La Orquette d'Ancizan, which is also tough. But they've ridden them at a fairly comfortable pace. I mean, not to take anything away from Luke Rowe at all, but if Luke Rowe was um, marshalling things all afternoon, that gives you an indication of what sort of pace was on. It wasn't It wasn't full gas, as they say. But I wonder it? if they'd swapped it around and had the time trial today and this stage tomorrow, what a different prospect yeah. it might have been. I think the design of the course was too clever there for once. You know, the, obviously the idea to have this mountain stage kind of quite, you know, quite a classic one, then an individual time trial, then a finish up a Lutomelio classic uh, climb of the tour, and, and the next day a more nervous stage for finishing at the, in a small, but uh, the, the, the idea was obviously to, to test every uh, capacity of the climbers and non-climbers. They, they would they almost have to change bikes every day of the weekend, and it, it was a little bit too clever because, I mean, all the teams were aware that, you know, the, the, the idea was was to, as we say in French, to, uh, uh, casser les jambes, you know, to break the legs. And, and the, but, but it turned out that it, it, they refused to play the, this game. They refused to make an effort. So they say, okay, you want us to change bikes? Well, we won't. You know, today we'll, we'll, we'll take a little, not rest, because I mean, it's never a rest on the tour, but a kind of warm obsession before tomorrow to time trial. We'll do the time trial full gas, and then the, the real battle will, will probably start on the tour my name. Well, in the absence of a story from the GC contenders, that's probably why there was so much focus on this, this peculiar story with Rowan Dennis and uh, the, the scrum around the Barre Merida bus. And certainly when I was there in the afternoon and, and seeing Dennis come out with his agent, Andrew McQuaid, who we, we know reasonably well, don't we, Rich? Um, well, not well enough that he's answering his phone well, now. No, <laughs> but I think, uh, I think that they certainly the Dennis camp reluctant to comment or add any... Um, clarification to what's gone on today and Barre Merida kind of fighting a bit of a fire there really not not really sure what to say it wasn't like in that scrum they they'd come up with a with a line mm. that they could that they could then issue they they stood and took questions which was quite a, a refreshing but mm. also a pretty ca catastrophic PR strategy really when you come out and there's 50 guys all 50 guys and women all wanting to ask questions you go on the front foot and say your piece and, and say this is what's happened. And I mean, I'm not saying lie, obviously, but come up with, with some kind of explanation because we're still none the wiser as yeah. to what's happened. And it invited all of the questions that, uh, that they will not have wanted. Pe somebody asked whether it was to do with doping. Somebody asked whether it was to do with his mental health, which is not something that really should be discussed in a kind of open forum. But if they had controlled the, the situation better and given the media something to feed on, it might have just make, made things a little less uncomfortable for them outside the bus yeah, this evening. He went to the point, I mean, and that's what made it interesting that at, at a stage during the, the when, when he actually gave up, uh, the, the, the rumor that spread around the press room was that he had vanished. Like he was like a lady vanishes, a, a rider vanishes, because we knew he had abandoned, which meant some commissaire had written down, you know, taken his bib uh, away from him. And, and from then on, where was he? You know, he it, it, it was lost. And it, even uh, uh, in the race, the French TV, they tried to get to Tom, Tommy Vockler, tried to get to Tristan Hoffman, who said, we don't know. We don't know why he abandoned. We don't know where he is. And, and so for, for a while, for like two hours almost, you know, the, uh, Ron Dennis had gone. He disappeared. And then he reappeared at the, at, at the team bus at the finale. But, but it, 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 it added a little bit of tension of suspense. You, can you imagine that? It's like, it's like, it like you know, like a crime movie or something. A, a rider vanishes, you know. Well, <laughs> especially when it's the world time trial champion on the eve of the only individual right. time trial in the race. And, and it means that he doesn't get to wear the rainbow jersey in a 
Tour de France time trial. There's no, been no indication that his form is bad. Um, we just don't know enough about the situation to even make a, 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 an informed guess at what's gone on. But clearly, that team is in a... a, a suffering from an uncertainty it's in a sort of limbo we know that that rod ellingworth will be starting work with them towards the end of the year my suspicion is that the staff on that team will be if not immediately certainly over a, a period of months or the first year will change absolutely dramatically um and probably for the better i would say but um for the riders as well you know vincenzo nibali is sort of serving his notice isn't he he's off to yes, trek segafredo yeah. and it, it looks like a team that's kind of floundering about a bit there's there's uh well you know there's no um no one holding the oars and there's a crack in the bottom of the boat yeah to kind of defend baron maria just a little bit because i mean uh, the, their team director made it clear during the press conference that they they were n not in a position to say anything because they haven't actually talked to uh to run dennis since uh, uh his withdrawal from the tour so maybe probably they want to have an explanation it, it, it sounds like it could be a tough well, even a rough uh, uh you know discussion but they, they pro they'll probably come up with an official statement when after they've discussed with because i mean if he really you know just walked out of the tour because of a disagreement with the team they, there could be sanctions i mean it's it's not something you do you know you're, you're not step out of the job just because you don't like what the boss is doing so we'll see it's like richard just downing his microphone for, <laughs> you know on a whim <laughs> the cycling podcast at the 2019 tour de france is supported by science in sport science in sport fueled by science Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport for their support of the Cycling Podcast. And if you want 25% off all their sports nutrition products, go to scienceandsport.com and enter the code SISCP25. Uh, don't forget also the Science and Sport competition. They are exclusive nutrition providers to Team Enios, of course. And they're offering a day in the team car at either the Vuelta or the Tour of Britain. Um, includes two nights accommodation, transport and 400 pounds spending money lots of good runner runners up prizes as well uh, go to scienceofsport.com forward slash sign up to enter that wonderful competition um, we're also running our own competition to win the atto folding bike the austin cycles atto folding bike which uh, has come into its own a little bit the last couple of days and tomorrow certainly will because tomorrow is la course the women's race in the morning and i'm going to be heading into that into pole on my bike we're gonna do a bit of videoing with it as well aren't we lionel we tomorrow we certainly are so looking forward to riding around pole on the bike tomorrow um to stand a chance of winning the bike go to uh the cyclingpodcast.com sign up to our newsletter and when you get the newsletter or if you're already a subscriber just click on the link through to austin cycles and uh and enter the reason why you should win it uh just one more here clayton davis has written a Lionel-esque limerick. Oh. There once was a podcast from Britain that became a mandatory listen. With cycling rumour, wit, wisdom and humour, my very first show I was smitten. Oh, that's fantastic. I think you're the winner, Clayton. No, no. Um, no, that is that is very nice. Um, very nice indeed. Um, David Griffin says, may I paraphrase a passionate Frenchman? The Austin Cycles Atto is a lifestyle. If you don't understand that, you should not be riding one. <laughs> <laughs> Francois, you're barred from the competition. If that's you, just under a, a false well, I, name. How did you find out it was me? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, what else have we got? Well, we've got, of course... Outside the team bus. Oh, you don't need me saying that, do you? No, just go straight to it. <laughs> Outside the team bus, with... Natne Brane, my team is from Team Coffee. A few days ago, uh, just before the rest day, I wanted to speak to you before the start, but you were, yeah, you yeah. were in another world. And yeah, then yeah. when I got back to the car, I heard you were in the brake and I understood why. Yeah. Were you focused on getting no, in that brake? not because of the, I want to take uh, on the position on the first of the part and then uh, on the last time he came to me and then uh, that's why I was, uh, you know, for the position for the going to the breakaway is really important, that was sorry for that. But obviously <laughs> it's, we needed uh, to be in the first part of the, to, for the line to go in the break. So that's why I was, uh, and anyway, now we are the time. <laughs> well, we understand you're here to race, obviously. How, to be in that first break, 
do you have to get to the start line and be right behind the, where the jersey holders line up? Yeah, yeah, we start on the line in the position to go if we want to go in the breakaway for sure. Sometimes, you know, they're going to close the, the uh, which teams they want to control or something with that. Uh, uh, maybe can uh, do it. Uh, so that's why we've been uh, in the first part for uh, that. So do you look to see which other riders are there and think maybe he will go? Or he would be good to be in a break with? Honestly, we, sometimes, yes, but uh, most of the times... Uh, you need to be in the first uh, if you want to go. Sometimes it's right by yourself, or you, you wait some seconds to be uh, to start somebody. Just before the tour, you went home to Eritrea. The the national championships were in your home city. Yes. Did you know you would be in the Tour de France before you went back to Eritrea? Yeah, for normally the... we were uh, on the long list for ten riders, and then after that, I was uh, hoping to win a national championship. Especially if he, I will come to Tour de France, I really wanted to be national championship uh, for that. I was a little bit stressful uh, before the race. <laughs> I really wanted to win uh, that uh, to give me more motivation, extra power for uh, upcoming the tour. I get uh, the chance I win. I'm so really happy of that also. And then that uh, what uh, my planning is going well for national championship. What's the national championship road race like in Eritrea? You know, in all of the world, it's important when you win national championship. And then in Eritrea, it's uh, you know, obviously it's uh, one of the best sport and then first sport in our country. It's like a culture, you know, it's a really famous sport in Eritrea. And then uh, all the people, they are seeing us for us once per year during national championship. And then uh, they are so excited to be with CC for us and then to race in there. And then uh, I'm so really happy that I'm in the national championship also. Cycling in Eritrea is, is very popular, we know, because when Daniel Tekla Hymanot had the King of the Mountains jersey in 2015, it was a big story. You were racing in the Tour of Austria when he was in the polka dot jersey, I think, but were you in contact with him at the time? D did you talk together? Yeah, yeah, normally we are so friend, uh, close friends with Daniel. We were in Center Mondial 2011 together and then after we went uh, for three, four years with uh, MTN and Dimension Data, we were the same team. And then until last year we were living together in Luca, so not, uh, we are not so far uh, in Luca, like one kilometer, two kilometer away. So we training so much uh, with Daniel also, with Daniel, Merhawi, Amaniel, Maxev, everyone that riders, uh, we are close in uh, Luca. Uh, and then we training in uh, Eritrea and Asmara also together uh, sometimes. So we are so friendly, closely, and then we had all the time uh, in contact uh, until now. So we are so closely friends also. You had a very good week in Austria that week. I think you were in the top five overall. Yeah. Uh, but also um, a rider racially abused you in that race as well. I mean, I, I, that was a story at the time. I wonder what the, what the attitude in the peloton is like now. It doesn't matter, you know, it's, uh, I'm black, uh, the other people is white, it doesn't change. We are all people, we born in nine months, so we are the same. I'm African, yeah, I, I come to represent Africa, yes, I know, that's, I'm so happy and I'm so proud of that. Joining Copidis this year, has it given you a different impression of, of how cycling teams are? Because of course you were with Dimension Data before, is it, has it been different riding in a French team? Uh, I was with French team before in 2013-14 when I turned pro and then we, I was with Europe Cup. I had a really great time and then after <clears throat> that uh, I went to MT and I wanted uh, to be with my friends, with uh, Eritrean people, to stay with them, to train with them. Sometimes you need it uh, close to you. When I come to Europe, when I come to French team uh, in uh, Europe car, uh, when I come to Europe car, uh, that's... Uh, I was alone, I wasn't necessary, and then that's why I chose to change a little bit uh, to go with the friends. But uh, anyway, I've been there for four years, and then now I come to the French team. Lastly, you have a you have a very distinctive jersey. It's a very beautiful jersey. Will we see it in a breakaway again before we reach Paris? Yeah, obviously, yeah. It's my target is uh, to go to breakaway. From now, I will see most of the days I will go to the breakaway. I know it's hard to be uh, to win the mountain jersey or something, but uh, why not? We're gonna try. We had some good points, 
Uh, before yesterday, I got uh, one podium, of my first Tour de France podium, that's awesome. And then uh, before the rest day, it gave me an extra energy and then I'm extra motivated for the upcoming racing to the Tour, uh, to the second part of the Tour. You have the red number, of course. Yeah, today I had red numbers for the competitive rider. So, yeah, today obviously a little bit, uh, I will uh, help to that my teammate uh, for Gigi if we can pass uh, for the sprint or something. But upcoming days so on the mountains, I will try to go in the breakaway to get some points and then to search some uh, top three to finish in the top mountains. Well, Lionel, he could run, but he couldn't hide. He couldn't <laughs> escape you forever, could he? No, no. And he's not been in the break since um, I spoke to him. <laughs> so, uh, oh dear, maybe I'll put the curse on poor Behani. Oh, well, uh, very interesting anyway. I mean, uh, outside the team bus feature continues to thrill and entertain yeah no, he's a good a good guy i'm glad you 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 know you you did uh, not nail virani i saw him win the tour of turkey a couple of year, years ago and uh, he well you appear to me of a very gifted and and nice and polite and really really great guy so uh yeah good choice who's in your sights tomorrow lionel who's got the crosshairs it's a one, isn't it on a time trial day um, it will be a case of when i'm around the team bus and uh, who catches my eye it's a Oh, so it'll be an uh, interview at first sight. I was at the EF Education First bus uh, tonight um, at the finish, and Mike Woods was in a pretty bad way. He crashed yesterday and went off for an x-ray at the finish, really s- struggling to move. Didn't look great at all for him. It's a short stage tomorrow, of course, but a time trial is not going to be easy for him on a time trial bike. It didn't look good for him at all. Um, I spoke to Tom Southern, their sports director, about the time trial, Um it's, it's an interesting one because the La Course is on the same course in the morning. The women do five laps. And uh, that means that the window for wrecking the, the course is quite small. Uh, there's about an hour and a half where riders can pass through the start in a, an hour and a half window. So that's their opportunity to go and take a look at the, the course. And um, there's quite a lot of riders still in the race, which, which means that that window is a little bit smaller. One or two abandons in the last couple of days, of course. But... You know, uh, Rigoberto ran, lost that time in the crosswind stage. So he's a bit, a bit back overall. But they say that he's in very good shape and still looking forward to the time trial and the final week. But you, Francois, spoke to somebody who who knows the course very well. Yeah, I I, I talked to Nicolas Portal, the uh, of course team director of Team Ineos, and uh, well, he should know the course well because. Uh, he, he lives in Po, he's from Po, so he's, he's back home, you know, and, and I'm sure he had lots of information to give uh, the Team Ineos riders, you know, when the, the, when the tour course was announced in October, and since then, you know, I'm sure lots of Rick Recon's videos, uh, you know, that they've probably checked the course already a couple of times, and so uh, anyway, everything he had to say about it, and also the interesting thing he said is, you know, it, we, we, we might think that the, 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 the time trial Trial w- could have been one of the stages where the difference between uh, Bernal and Thomas might might appear. But he said exactly the opposite. He said the the, the course being what it is, it suits them both. So uh, yeah, still uncertainty, uh, and and maybe the time trial won't change anything. You'll be at home, Nicolas. So I I, I suppose you know this uh, parkour very well. Yes, yes, that's some road that I've been training uh, <laughs> quite a. Uh, yeah, for a long time ago and qu- qu- quite a lot. Um, so yeah, yeah, I know I know the time trial really well. Yes. What what are the is the main characteristics of this uh, time trial in your opinion? Well, also in general, it's sweet both. You know, it's sweet specialists and uh, it's sweet also uh, some uh, climbers who uh, they are not too bad on, on the TT. And um, so I think um, in general, you will set uh, let's say the pure climbers. They are not really uh, super special on the TT like Barde or. We lost, if they're in good form, they go the right pacing, they should lose less time than if it will be totally flat. Then there's still uh, three climbs. The first one is quite hard, and it's two, two small valleys we, we, um, we go across. And obviously, uh, yeah, you, you, you want to have the right pacing. If you go too hard on the first one or the second one, or you, and you start to blow, then all the way back, uh, when you have to push on the flat until the finish, more or less, uh, you're not going to be that fresh, or it, it, the pacing is going to be... Uh, it's going to be really important. So, so, so more for Garant or more for Egan? I think both. I mean, both, both of them. Uh, both, they are good time, time trialists. Egan is, is pretty good. He's been national champion. He's done some really good uh, TT. Obviously, advantage of, of G. 
is clearly a better time trialist than than Egan, but Egan done some. He's been beating some of the specialists in in Swiss and also in, in Pyrenees. So, uh, and he was a national champion two year, uh, last year. So yeah, he's doing well. He's doing. It, 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 it's all about pacing. Uh, if you pace yourself well, then you know you're gonna get the best of yourself. Uh, you cannot go faster than what, what you what, what you can do, obviously. And so, I think for pure climbers, sometimes they uh, it's hard for them to pace on the flat, on the downhill, and on the, on the, on the uphill. So, uh, but Egan is pretty good at this. Yeah, interesting. Um, I think we expect a pretty strong performance from Gary and Thomas tomorrow. Um, another thing David Walsh was saying to us this evening, Lionel, was he was wondering whether Team Ineos slash Team Sky had ever really had it so easy in the first almost two weeks of the Tour de France. Um, now, the, the course is, is very backloaded and the, the real tests are obviously to come. Um, but it's been a... A kind of you know a very sort of gentle run into this final sort of eight nine days and um yeah i'm sure the riders won't all agree with that but you know it's been noticeable and it was again today that if you look at it there only seems to be one team here to tr- to win the tour de france i mean everybody else is hedging their bets you've got Mitchelton scott now with two stage wins which is great for them you got Astana finally today putting a rider up in the break, Peo Bilbao, who's one of their strongest riders in the mountains. And it does look like every other team is hedging their bets. No other team is, has got this singular focus behind a leader. Well, maybe Group Armour FDJ with Thibaut Pinot. That's a good point. Um, and Movie Star as well. They didn't try anything, but yeah, it might do, and they never try anything. Have the, <laughs> they have the, the confusion. I mean, their, um, their strategy is so opaque. I mean, Valverde's uh, move on the stage to La Planche de Belfi was, well, it was self-sacrifice and it, it's ruled him out of, of um, the being one of the three. So, But they do still have Quintana and Landa reasonably well placed. Well, I mean, not Landa. Mm, he's lost a lot of time now. Yeah, for, I mean, 4.15. But, yeah, but Landa, we know, is always quite comfortable coming from behind. He's going to he's gonna gain time, isn't he, and, and move up the overall. But the thing about Thomas and Bernal is only four seconds separate them at the moment. What, if, if I had to say, I know I hate speculation, so I'm not going to answer my own question, but what will be the time gap between them tomorrow? 25 seconds. In Thomas's favour? Can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's the point. That's the point. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Bernal showed in the Tour de Suisse as well. He could ride, you know, very good time trials. He won Paris. Nice. There was a very, uh, you know, bumpy time trial there, and he it it did well. So no, it's it's not it's not to be discounted. They 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 might be pretty close actually. I think Thomas will take a bit of time out of him. Sure. In all seriousness, but I think maybe. Maybe up to 30 seconds, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, in that Paris-Nice time trial, which Simon Yates won. Absolutely. Um, Bernard was sixth, only 15 seconds behind Yates. I mean, similar sort of distance. And it was a not a dissimilar course, was it, in the, in the terms of its you know, lumpy. Mm. Um, so that's an interesting comparison. Uh, what about Julian Alaphilippe? Because I referenced his Dauphiné time trial the, uh, last night. He surely is... He's got enough an, uh, of an advantage to. He'll to keep. Stay he'll keep the yellow. jersey. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, uh, my, my take. I mean, we, we we already discussed that. And to me, the, the the big test, and I think he knows it, is the Tourmalet. Satisfied nods all round there. <laughs> uh, we've we've nailed it. We know exactly what's going to happen tomorrow, and then tomorrow's so podcast. Let's take the next few days <laughs> off. <laughs> we'll, st- we'll start with <laughs> apologising for the list. La the course less predictable. Um, although my mm. tip for La Course is Marin Vos after her. Stage winning exploits at the Giro Rosa on what is quite, I mean, it's going to be an interesting little glimpse of the, the time trial course, the women riding it five times. And yeah, it's, it sounds like, a, from Nicola Portal's words as well, you know, it sounds like a sporting, a sporting course, which I think the form that he's in as well, I think Pino could do okay. You know, the, mm, they, rode oh, yeah, a, yeah. They, they rode a very good team yeah, time absolutely. trial. And I think as long as his. You know his head's still okay after the time that he lost in the time trial, in the in the crosswinds rather. I think he could he could do all right. Well, the interesting thing is, 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 is it'll be a kind of a summary of the tour itself actually. Normally, I mean, you know, if all the, the contenders uh, were there, uh, we would have predicted, uh, uh, you know, Chris Froome and Tom Dumoulin, you know, uh, smashing the, the the field, you know, tomorrow, but they're not there. Well, we look forward to tomorrow, don't we? Well, let's just look back to last night in the first 
de- delicious dish of cassoulet that I enjoyed <laughs> on this Tour de France in the Place du Capitol in the centre of Toulouse. I would say it was a good quality cassoulet. It had a nice sprinkling of breadcrumbs on the top and some greenery on the top, just some herbs chopped onto the top. N- I'm not sure that counts as one of my five a day vegetables, but uh, carrots and carrots. carrots. Yeah, there were carrots in there. Yeah, controversial carrots. Yeah, I even said uh, you know to put carrots in uh, in uh, cassoulet is, is like uh, having a Dutch rider riding for movie star. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the the goose and the sausage were both very good. The beans were nice and soft. My only slight note to the chef would be that the the the, the juice was just a little bit thin. Could perhaps have done with uh, another 45 minutes in the in the oven to t- take on a little bit more of that fat and bean goodness. Well, if you're listening, chef, um, the, that's for free. <laughs> that's for nothing from Lionel Bernie, the 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 cassoulet gourmand. Ju- just just to point out quickly king, that king of uh, the cassoulet. Yeah, we arrived in Bannière de Bigorre, but as as the name implies, Bannière meaning bath. This is a thermal city, so famous for its waters. That's why we left, uh, <laughs> and then we're on our way. Uh, well, ne- near Po actually tonight. Two nights in Po. Two nights in Po. Well, just outside Po. Uh, we better get on the road because we've mm. got a restaurant booking. Um, before we go, just uh, once again, f- our thank yous to some friends of the podcast uh, tonight. Well, we've had a few questions asking how we select the names. Um, it's done pretty much at random, but I usually just look up a, a date. I think we've done some from December when we launched the Friends uh, program, some from January, some from the start of this tour and, and during this tour. Uh, but we're trying to just pick them at random. Um, but tonight's uh, friends of the podcast who we're going to thank, they're all people who are members of our Facebook discussion group. If you'd like to join that, then do so Search through Facebook. And you've got to answer a couple of questions. Yeah, to prove and then they're genuine. To prove that you really do listen to the podcast. But if they're listening to this message, then obviously they're listening. If you got this far, yeah. Um, so thank you to Gary Hibbert, Ross Jeffries, Mark Guthrie, Goran Raven and Steve Trice. Yeah, you, you actually uh, yielded to pressure there, uh, Richard, because on, on that, that group, they, they saw some mentioned they were not being cited, but never mind. Uh, uh, w- w- which was the last year? Kirsty Nutt, Kevin O'Hagan, Tim Phillips, Claire Hung, Luke, Luke Beatty, Paddy Dunn, Stuart Brown. And thank you to Steve Dickinson, Ben Jensen, Richard Wise, Julie Gill, Nick Atkin, Graham Lofman, and Mark Ng. I hope that's right, Mark. I've, I've, we've, we've met before, but I'm not entirely certain. The pronunciation police might be waiting just around this corner. Please let me know whether I got that right or wrong, Mark. Thank you, gentlemen, and we'll be back tomorrow night. Thank you, Francois. Thank you. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Richard.